You were on the Saddam raid. Yep. Let's go into detail on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that one. So, so that happened Halloween night. Um, and then in the, that was so October 31st. So the month of November, we call it, was like whack-a-mole. It was like, we get some Intel hit here, or there, some guy that was connected. I mean, we were all over the country trying to catch Saddam. Uh, it got to the point where it was comical, like where we were laughing about it. You know, we would pre-stage at, at this point, they've got fobs established in various points of the country. So we would pre-stage at these fobs do a broad daylight helo assault to an objective. And then that evening we'd get another hit and we'd do a, you know, ground-based vehicle in fill and hit a target in Baghdad. And then we'd fly back to Ramadi and we'd hit a target in Ramadi. It was like one after another, after another 24 hour ops. We were literally exhausted. And then lo and behold, uh, early December. So it was December 12th of 2003. Um, we got a hit on a guy uh, came up, it doesn't matter how they figured it out, but signal intelligence, a guy popped up and on a phone and it was a guy that we had been tracking named Mohammed Ibrahim al Muslit. And Muslit is who our intelligence analysts, uh, it's not unlike the bin Laden story in that there was really one person that had been working the problem set from day one. Uh, and they were really the key person for tracking down an individual. Um, we had an Intel guy that, that, tirelessly poured over information and details and data and background and history and had a pretty good idea of how and where Saddam would be, who would be connected to him, and then had further developed how he was getting information out, giving orders out, whatever, and who was hiding him. And Muslit was the key to this. He was the key courier or messenger, if you will, that probably knew where Saddam was and was responsible for giving Saddam's orders out to, you know, the, the sort of network that was spread around Iraq. Uh, so we called him the golden ticket. <laughs> and so they told us they, that we had a possible for Muslit and it was in Baghdad, um, which we were surprised. It actually wasn't far from uh, where we were based out of our, our mission support site, the house that we lived in in Baghdad in the green zone. And so we rolled out on vehicles um, we hit the initial target. It was a troop plus, so it was three teams plus a team from, from another troop um, that hit the initial target, and it was a dry hole. Like, the Moose wasn't there. N nothing of value was there. They didn't know anything. Um, but while we were there, you know, we were dead silent. It wasn't like we blew doors and all that stuff. It was a pretty quiet hit. I think they got, a, they got a hit, another hit, and they narrowed down his location, and it was a couple of blocks away. Um, so we moved. It was a kind of four apartments in one house. So it was two upstairs, two downstairs with a stairwell that ran up the middle and then split. So you had one apartment on the right and one apartment on the left. Um, I ended up being the, the lead team on the apartment on the right. And I was a breacher at the time. And, and another team had the door on the left. Um, just putting a charge up on the exterior door. It was a dual door. So I had to open the exterior and put a charge in between the two to get them to blow both directions. So I'd open the door, place my charge. The team behind me on the other door had done the same and somebody in there had like bumped something and made a noise. So I was on a knee and just put the charge on the door and a guy came to my door and like looked at me and I'm weapon slung cause I'm putting the charge on the door but I pulled my pistol out and I just stuck it up in his face. And I said in English, basically I mouthed open the door and he looked at me and he went, and so he opened the door. Um, I basically just rode the door into him as soon as he turned the handle, pushed him against the wall and just held him there as the team made entry behind me. Cleared the room, cleared the first room. I think it had a bathroom and maybe one or two bedrooms off of it. All secure, nothing. You know, no, nobody in the house. <laughs> Progressed to SSE. So we're talking to the guy that I've had, had against the wall. Cuff that dude. They're doing a little battlefield interrogation with him. And the other guys are going through portions of the house and we hear a call from one of the back bedrooms and it's a teammate. He's like, Hey, I need, I need a guy. There's somebody under the bed back here. And so a guy went, pulled the mattress up and laying underneath the bed on the floor was a guy like this as flat as he could be. And he had a toy plastic AK 47 laying next to him. A toy, a toy, a kid's toy. Shit. You're not. And so pick this guy up. He didn't look like the photos we had of Mooselet. Um, 
we didn't think we on the ground didn't think it was him. Ah, whatever. It's another one of those dry holes. But they were both a little weird and a little shady, and there was a few things on target that didn't make sense. Um, and one of them was in the SSE and Mooselet's wallet. He had you know a couple thousand dollars worth of cash, and it was in U.S. hundreds. The U.S. hundreds were sequential, so the serial numbers on the bills were literally in order. So like zero zero eight five one zero zero eight five two zero zero eight five three. You guys figure that out right there on the spot. Yeah. So the the you don't see that, right? Like, unless it came out of a large sum of money that was withdrawn from an institution at one time, that just doesn't happen. But regardless, like, it didn't look like our guy. We didn't think our was guy. And then we'd been chasing Saddam for a year. So we're like, it's just another dry hole. So we drove the detainees back to Biap, handed them off to our intel analysts and some of the interrogators that had set up shop there at Baghdad International Airport. Uh, and we went home. And like I said, 24 hour ops, you know, at the time it was commonplace to like pop an ambient when you got back from a mission. So you knew you could get three or four hours of sleep before they woke us up to go do the next one. So I think we popped an ambient, maybe had a beer or two. We're like, up oh, another dry hole. And we went to bed. About four hours went by. Our intel guy comes running back in to the MSS. He comes back to where our troops rooms are because we were the ones that had just pulled this dude out. And he goes, it's him, man. It's totally him. And we're like, what? Well, you're ridiculous. There's no way it's him. Yeah. No, it's him. It's Mooselet. It's the golden ticket. And he is spilling his guts. He knows where he is. He knows who's with him. You guys need to get your shit on. Get ready. We're going to Decrit. And we're like, all right. So we had a, our, another one of our troops, our recce troop actually was in Decrit. So they stuck Mooselet on a helicopter and by app, they flew him up to Tikrit, handed it off to them. We loaded up in vehicles and started the drive, a couple hour drive up to Tikrit from Baghdad. Uh, they took Mooselet out and did a close target reconnaissance in a couple different areas. Um, and what it was, was what our intel analysts thought all, all along. He was going to be near Tikrit, near Samara or whatever the town he grew up in was that he was going to only have a tight knit group of people around him, that he was going to be near the river because Saddam loved fish like any he, he had a real strict diet and he only ate fish and he had a personal chef and that chef had a family farm and walt always believed that those were going to be the people closest to saddam because he was paranoid and this dude had been with him forever so we identified the cook's house and we identified the cook's farm the house was in town the family farm was outside of town uh and we came up with a plan um after those two were pointed out based on the reconnaissance where we were going to split up as a squadron. My troop was going to take the house in town. The other troop, plus snipers, was going to take the farm. Um, and we did a simultaneous hit on both those uh, places. Um, while we were doing the hit on the house in town, uh, I think the guys finished up on the farm about the same time. Uh, and the call came back from the farm that it was a dry hole, that it wasn't the right place. It wasn't the cook's family. Like, something was off. Um, but we had Case, the chef, uh, and he identified himself as Case, although he didn't say he was Saddam's personal chef. Um, battlefield interrogation right there very quickly led to, yep, I'm Case the cook, I'm Saddam's personal chef, uh, and yeah, he's been hiding out with my family. Um, so what had happened was Mooselet, in a last-ditch effort to defend Saddam, had pointed out the wrong farm, knowing he was on another one. Um, so after some work and driving the guy out and confirming locations, they realized they were one farm off. Well, luckily, C1 had hit the first farm, total blackout, no charges, no flashbangs, no nothing. They had done it completely silent, so they hadn't spooked anybody. Uh, they shifted over and hit the next farm. Uh, and then, yeah, shortly after that, they uncovered the rug with the rope to the cork plug in the hole, uh, pulled the cork out and saw this looking down on a guy. Pulled him out of the hole, and it was Saddam. No shit. Yeah. Were you surprised he came back alive? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, during that phase of the war, your your marching orders were kill or capture. Um, you had rules of engagement that warranted either one. Um, I think with Saddam, it was understood that, that we weren't bringing him back. Um, that being said... It's a unit operator, and we're the good guys. And they pulled the cork out of the hole, and there was an unidentified male with his hands over his head. Yeah. The guys aren't going to put a bullet in him, and they certainly weren't going to pull him out, look at him, and put a bullet in him because that's not what we do. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, friends of mine, guys, so this is second hand. I'm still in town going, man, I hope this is it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> We're like sitting in the vehicle at this point, just waiting on the radio call. And, uh, but yeah, they, they pulled him out of the hole. Holy shit, it's Saddam. Um, and yeah, that, that was kind of it. So they, the radio call came, and uh, I think the squadron commander at the time said, I have a possible for BL number one. Holy shit. And so, yeah, we were pretty freaking ecstatic. The joke was, is on the way there, we were like placing bets with each other. Like, do you think this is it? And in the beginning, when we first left Baghdad, we were all like, bullshit, that's not it. There's no way it's going to be another dry hole. By the time we got there and like the CTR had happened and all that stuff was going on, we were all kind of coming around like, all right, maybe this is it. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember there's so many weird moments from that night. You know, just besides being a significant part of history, and it obviously means more now than even it did at the time. But I remember like kitten up to go do that originally. And I remember the dogs, you know, when you put your kid on, the dogs would get fired up because mm -hmm. they knew it was go time. And it was like the one time that I really noticed it. Like they were like panting and like ready to go just because we were putting our gear on. And it just felt different. Like I just was like, yeah, this is, this might work out. Wow. So, yeah, so, you know, brought him back. Um, Did you see him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a few cool things happen. Like, there's some pictures that exist. There's some pictures that made it out from that. Um, but uh, one of the cool things that happened was we brought him back to Tikrit, and we had him in our detention facility there. We had next to the house the guys were staying in there. And they let us basically all come into the open hall of this house um, when we walked him out to put him on the helo to fly him down to Biap. So there was an opportunity for everybody that was a part of the operation to physically see him and be close to him and understand the significance of the event. And I thought that was a cool call by the leadership. Uh, the pictures that made it out were actually taken by a by a interpreter that worked for a three letter agency. Um, a lot of pictures were taken that day, and then the understanding was these are for years and years only, and they don't they're not for public release. But she immediately emailed those to someone, and they ended up finding their way onto the internet. But uh, it's ancient history now, so it doesn't matter. But at the time, it was a big deal. Yeah, I can imagine. But yeah, so flew him down to Biop, and and uh, yeah, he he stayed there. Um, it was a different animal than years later with Bin Laden. But Saddam sat basically in a prison cell for a year till they hung him after publicly trying him and the whole thing that happened after that. But did you did you feel anything when when they hung him? We, I mean, when they kicked him off what a two or three story. Thing and yeah, I mean, when they hung him, you know, there's an element of wanting to be there. Yeah. Um, I mean, we per personally witnessed a lot of the horror that that guy was responsible for. Like, we had seen the scars from it. We, you, you know, it was, he was a ruthless, ruthless dictator. And right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, as a soldier, as a service member, you're an extension of U.S. foreign policy. Right. And you are there to do what they ask you to do. And we were asked to complete a mission and we did. And so even years later, with all the hindsight on the Iraq war, I still think that what we did is the right thing, even if the reasons for getting us there weren't necessarily just. He was a horrible, awful person responsible for brutally murdering thousands of people. 